so much for the introduction. It really is a, a pleasure uh, to be here and have an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, where I see precision medicine today uh, and where it's going in the, in the near term. And I'll draw examples uh, both from some of our work in neurodevelopmental diseases and also in the study of kidney diseases. Uh, first, uh, in terms of disclosures, uh, I founded a, an epilepsy and neurodevelopmental a precision medicine company called Praxis, and I've been a consultant to Goldfinch Bio. Um, perhaps one of the most important drivers in the uh, recent uh, excitement surrounding precision medicine um, is diagnostic sequencing. Uh, this really started uh, to emerge in its current form uh, around 10 years ago, a little over now. Um, and in its uh, most standardized form now, you start with a patient um, that has a presu presumed genetic disease, but you don't know what the genetic basis is. Uh, and you sequence that patient and often uh, the patient's parents and look through the entire genome uh, in order to try to, to try to find the cause of disease. Um, and really the key point to make about this diagnostic paradigm that's uh, deployed either using whole exome or whole genome sequencing increasingly, most important point to make is that it is now a remarkably successful uh, clinical test. And if you look across a broad range of therapeutic areas, when there's a strong presumption of a genetic disease, but, but really uh, either absolutely no or very little knowledge of where in the genome the responsible gene is, across a broad, broad range of, of uh, therapeutic areas, uh, complete sequencing of the protein coding part of the genome can identify the cause of disease as often as uh, up to 50% of the time. And this is really a, a much higher success rate uh, than those of us who were thinking about deploying this in the beginning uh, expected. And it really uh, does represent one of the really important uh, advances in precision medicine and contributions of our current capacity to systematically evaluate variation in patient genomes and to effectively interpret that variation. Um, we have been deploying this uh, diagnostic paradigm uh, at the Columbia University Medical Center now for some years, uh, and we've sequenced uh, up to about 10,000 patients, um, both those seen locally and, and, and others, uh, and subjected those uh, genome sequences to individual level evaluation to try to find the causes of disease. Uh, and we've been performing these analyses across really a very broad range of presentations. And the consideration of this really broad range of presentations um, allows us to make comparisons uh, of the type of genetic control we see uh, for different types of diseases. And so we have focused uh, in partnership uh, with Ron Wapner at Columbia on um, prenatal conditions such as fetal anomalies and stillbirths. We focused on neurological diseases, um, the now very traditional um, undiagnosed uh, uh, diseases. Um, and we've also focused on um, often later onset conditions such as chronic kidney disease, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about later, and ALS. Uh, but one of the advantages of this broad portfolio of diagnostic work is that we really can make direct comparisons uh, using the exact same diagnostic um, approaches. And I'll just illustrate one very interesting pattern that we've observed. Uh, when you run bioinformatic analyses to look for enrichment of apparently responsible mutations um, in genes that are good candidates for causing disease because they are under, for example, purifying selection in the human population, what you find in most of these presentations is a very clear enrichment of apparently pathogenic mutations in genes that are already known to cause human disease. In the stillbirth cases, we have a marked contrast to that, where we see a very clear enrichment of loss of function mutations in genes that are intolerant to loss of function mutations, but specifically in genes that are not already known to cause postnatal human genetic diseases. Um, and the inference here is, is that um, uh, strongly active mutations in these genes uh, actually are not compatible with development to term. And so you actually don't learn about these genes by studying postnatal disease. You actually have to focus on the, uh, the prenatal presentation to, to find out about these genes. So we've been practicing these diagnostic paradigms for some years now. I'm gonna now try to give you a little bit of a feeling of the kinds of things that have been coming out 
So of course, what we hope to do with these kinds of diagnostic sequencing approaches is learn something about the cause of disease in an individual patient and use that knowledge uh, to improve the way uh, that patient is treated. Um, this is really, I think, fundamentally what precision medicine is all about. And it sometimes actually does work out exactly that way. We had an example some years ago uh, of a child that presented with a highly progressive neurological disease at 18 months of age that stumped the clinical team. Uh, we performed uh, exome sequencing, uh, looking at her exome and her parents. And we very quickly, uh, really within minutes of seeing the genetic data, uh, saw pathogenic mutations in this gene SLC52A2, very clearly pathogenic mutations uh, that unequivocally indicated a diagnosis for the child of Brown uh, Violetta von Leer syndrome. And critically, uh, this very rare syndrome uh, is treated uh, by supplementing the patient's diet with uh, an awful lot of, uh, of a vitamin, vitamin B2, uh, because the disease results from not having a cellular transporter of vitamin. Um, really immediately upon administration of the, of the uh, uh, vitamin uh, to the patient, Kara Green, uh, the deterioration of, uh, of her condition uh, stopped and uh, her symptoms began improving across the board. And she moved from a, a very, very worrying trajectory to a, a near no normal development. And this really is an example of precision medicine because the clinical team were really uh, uniform in the view that they would not have arrived at this diagnosis uh, without the genetics. And this diagnosis really made a big difference. Uh, we have other examples of this sort through the diagnostic sequencing work. Uh, a recent example um, is a 30-year-old uh, patient um, that had a, a lifelong history of developmental issues uh, upon sequencing. We found clearly uh, pathogenic uh, mutations in a gene uh, responsible uh, for a xanthomatosis condition. Um, and uh, importantly, uh, this uh, condition is uh, treated with a, a targeted uh, approved treatment. And this um, condition has these characteristic xanthomas, but those don't appear actually usually until around 35, at which point it's more typical to arrive at a diagnosis. Uh, but the genetics uh, allowed a diagnosis years earlier than would have been the case. And it's known that outcomes are improved um, the earlier you start um, treatment. We also have examples of changes in management that can occur very late in life or later in life. Um, and with an example of um, uh, this 70 year old patient with um, uh, a white matter disease uh, that upon sequencing uh, was uh, determined to have a recognized uh, syndrome that um, is not helped by the treatment that the patient was on before and the patient was then taken off of that treatment. And we had uh, examples of a patient, uh, an example of a patient uh, in, in his 50s uh, with a clear case of dent disease that wasn't uh, recognized as such, which again is associated with the targeted treatment. Uh, so these examples make clear that what we hope to do with precision medicine and genomics really can happen. Uh, but it's also true that very often when you look at a patient's genome and you find out uh, with high confidence um, the genetic cause of their disease, uh, it's very often the case that there's nothing that you can do afterwards that makes a really big difference to the patient. And so we often do uh, bump into this uh, roadblock where we know what the patient has, but we can't really make an important impact on their management. And I really wanna emphasize here what I mean by an important impact on management. If you're extremely liberal with your interpretation of an impact on the patient's management, then you can arrive at estimates that most of the time you get a genetic diagnosis that actually has an impact on the patient's care. Uh, but that's only using a very, very liberal, liberal interpretation. As, as an example of what I mean, you might find that the genetics suggest that you use a treatment um, that you would have tried anyway, even if you didn't know the genetics. And so maybe in that case, the genetics would allow you to change the order in which you tried available treatments. This happens, for example, with anti-epileptic drugs. But I don't think it's fair to say that that really is a transformational change in the management of, 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 the, of the patient's condition. Uh, if we actually think about what we're doing when we perform these kinds of diagnostic studies, it really is clear that um, it's going to be a minority of the time that we have a really transformational impact on the patient's uh, management because um, 
we're actually um, starting with a patient where we don't know what they have. And we're actually looking at their genome and lining them up with one of the approximately 4,000 um, genes that are known to cause one or more Mendelian diseases. And if you start with those 4,000 genes, it turns out that it's actually a relatively small proportion of them that have highly effective targeted treatments associated with them. So if we really want to expand out the impact of precision medicine approaches, we really need to actually develop much more effective targeted treatments for um, strongly genetic diseases. And so we've been working pretty hard on this in the Institute, developing a variety of model systems where we start with the mutations that cause disease in individual patients, we build mouse models with those mutations or we build cellular models and then we characterize the features of the model in order to try to understand something about the biology of disease and to try to find um, effective intervention points for the effects of the disease causing mutations. And this is actually very, very challenging, laborious work. And when you think about the many thousands of um, uh, disease genes um, that uh, don't have effective treatments associated with them, it really makes clear that we have a great deal of work uh, ahead of us. One thing that I can say maybe slightly more on the encouraging side is that even though there are lots and lots of genes uh, that don't have effective treatments, um, the genes actually um, are uh, in um, definable functional groupings. And I think that it is uh, reasonable to expect that similar approaches will be uh, relevant for related groups of genes. And just as one example of this, if you look specifically in neurodevelopmental uh, disease genes, it turns out that an awful lot of these disease genes um, have um, their effects on disease through an effect on the expression of many hundreds of other genes. So you can actually think of these disease genes as being transcriptomic in nature, where you have a mutation, for example, in a transcription factor, uh, and that mutation in the transcription factor dysregulates the expression of many hundreds uh, of genes or thousands in multiple cell types, uh, and that is what causes disease. And if you look at the single gene causes of conditions like um, autism and, and uh, epilepsy uh, and um, uh, developmental delay and schizophrenia, it turns out that it, um, a proportion as high as, as 43% in autism of all the single gene uh, diseases are transcriptomic in nature. And this suggests the possibility of a common paradigm uh, for treating this whole class of genes. And we've been thinking about developing this, this paradigm focused on transcriptomic restoration, um, an approach uh, that has ha seen a lot of effort and work in cancer, but not much in neurodevelopmental diseases. And the basic idea here is that you can start with one of these neurodevelopmental um, disease genes, uh, develop models for them, uh, mouse, cellular, organoid, characterize the uh, dysregulation that's mediated by the disease causing mutations, and then look for compounds that have complementary effects on gene expression in order to push the gene expression pattern back towards normal. And what we find exciting about this paradigm is that it really might apply to a broad class of genes as I've uh, recently out outlined. Uh, we have recently performed a, a lot of this work in the lab, now led by a graduate student, uh, Andrew Ressler, specifically for a transcriptomic neurodevelopmental disease, disease gene called HNRNPU, where we get really quite clear signatures of dysregulation, uh, both in the mouse and in organoids. And we're now looking uh, for ways to actually restore that back towards normal. Um, one of the more striking things to emerge from recent diagnostic sequencing efforts is really how frequently you find uh, apparent single gene uh, contributions to disease in presentations that have uh, traditionally been thought of as very complex. Um, and this, I think, really does expand out the domain of application of these kind of targeted precision medicine approaches um, that I've been talking about. Uh, and so work that uh, we've been doing together with um, uh, members of Ali Garavi's group in medicine at Columbia, including uh, Emily Groupman, have focused on um, the genetics of uh, adult onset chronic kidney disease. And really strikingly, um, as many as one in 10 uh, patients uh, with chronic kidney disease um, have a clear underlying Mendelian cause of their disease. Um, and this is often not recognized clinically. And when you think about how common chronic kidney disease is affecting as many as one in 10 people, 
um, you realize that this really represents a dramatic expansion in terms of the types and numbers of patients that can benefit from this kind of diagnostic sequencing paradigm. And it's also very often the case um, when you deploy this kind of diagnostic sequencing in the context of, uh, of chronic kidney disease, um, that there are um, uh, uh, clinical implications. So this, I think, creates a very strong motivation for an expansion of this diagnostic um, uh, framework into chronic kidney disease. And in fact, this is something that we're seeing in other disease areas, uh, for example, including uh, work that we've done in partnership with AstraZeneca in, uh, in heart failure. Uh, and so I think these kinds of examples really do suggest that we should be looking beyond where you might expect to regularly find Mendelian causes uh, in clinical settings. Uh, one concern that is often voiced about uh, Develop, drug development efforts for targeted therapies is that it might be very challenging to perform the clinical trials because uh, the conditions that you're targeting in the first place are fairly rare. And then if you say that you want to test a treatment that is targeted to a particular genetic cause of an already rare disease, um, then that can be very difficult to actually find the patients to enroll. We've actually been looking at this in the context of the diagnoses that we've um, obtained only at Columbia. We actually think that the clinical trial part of this may be a little more manageable than at least some have feared. Um, this slide um, illustrates the, a number of genes that in our own diagnostic sequencing work of patients only seen at Columbia um, that have multiple diagnoses at the medical center. And what you can see here is that for many genes, we have many patients that have clear diagnoses in those genes. And if you think about how targeted treatments are likely to be tested, where what you're really looking for um, is a highly effective targeted treatment to be tested in a very homogeneous population, only patients with the disease on uh, presentation due to mutations in an individual gene, uh, you realize that you'll really usually be testing these targeted treatments in quite small numbers of patients. And so I think that as long as medical centers um, prepare their clinical populations for targeted trials by performing genetic studies, by carefully vetting the genetic diagnoses and having the genetic data available alongside clinical data, we really will empower these kinds of targeted, genetically targeted precision medicine trials and really allow us to systematically evaluate uh, the leads uh, that emerge from the kind of model systems that I was describing earlier. Uh, the final point that I'll make um, is that uh, the motivation for developing these kinds of targeted treatments actually extends beyond the already very good motivation of being able to treat some of these uh, very um, harmful diseases um, uh, effectively. Um, and that is because many of these genes that are responsible for rare devastating diseases um, actually represent really good targets for more common diseases. And the clearest way to illustrate that is that if you go um, to drug bank and take uh, approved drugs and ask what they target, it turns out that they preferentially target genes that cause Mendelian diseases at, at a rate of nearly three, three to one. Um, and so what this uh, suggests to me is that a systematic effort to find uh, treatments for these uh, rare diseases would actually uh, land us also with a portfolio of compounds that end up relevant to a range of uh, common diseases. So really just further motivation for drug development for these rare presentations. Um, and that's what I wanted to cover and just wanna end by uh, thanking you uh, very much uh, for your attention and, and invitation to participate.